I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. My topic today is my Hitler journey. And on the Substack version, I'll have linked the 11 other episodes that I've now made that took me on this journey to what I never expected. And the question I'll be asking now is, was he a hero to Germans and a villain to Jews or the reverse? Let's dig in. I will be reading this, so do whatever is your preference, watching, listening, reading. But I suggest you do go to thirdparadigm.substack.com because that's where all the links will be. And also, a couple of people have had comments go missing on YouTube lately that they put a lot of work into. The conversation threads on Substack are, in my opinion, unparalleled. There are real deep conversations happening there and the exchange of a lot of more information. So check it out. Thank you to Vanessa Bealey for reposting my episode on Kissinger and the Balfour. This brought it to the attention of Mark Elsis of earthnewspaper.com. For 27 years, Mark has been collating and preserving close to 10,000 posts per year in searchable archives. I noticed that the Mike Yaden Address to Parliament is number one in today's offerings. I had the honor of being number one with the Kissinger Post and number two on another day with my David Irving Post. So thank you for that connection, Vanessa. In our correspondence, Mark has sent me links to his work, such as the Holocaust Revisionism, 162 pages, and Hitler's Peace Plans, 92 pages. In the facetiously titled, Hitler Wanted to Take Over the World, Mark answers a question I've had for some time. It starts by quoting Sheldon Emery, saying, Germany issued debt-free and interest-free money from 1935 on, which accounts for Germany's startling rise from the Depression to a world power in five years. The German government financed its entire operations from 1935 to 1945 without gold and without debt. It took the entire capitalist and communist world to destroy the German revolution and bring Europe back under the heel of the bankers. Then Mark writes, The Jewish oligarchy in control of most of the world's central banks realized they mustn't let this system become established, or the creation of currency out of thin air, fractional reserve banking, and charging exorbitant compound interest would soon vanish. Therefore, Germany had to be destroyed using all means necessary. And then he quotes Adolf Hitler, The nation does not exist for the sake of the economic system, and the economic system does not exist for the sake of capital. On the contrary, capital is the servant of the economic system, and the economic system is the servant of the people. Mark also sent me four videos. I had already done the 12-hour marathon of Europa, the Last Battle by Tobias Bratt, and I think I finished a thousand-piece puzzle at the same time. And I'm saving the six-and-a-half-hour Adolf Hitler, The Greatest Story Never Told for a painting project. But the following one changed everything I thought I knew in an hour and a half. It's not an exaggeration to say my life will never be the same. This film is Hellstorm by Kyle Hunt. The pivotal event of the Eurocentric order is World War II. The first was the Great War, but the second was even better. It was the Good War, the moral measure of every war to come. I've been saying that I knew what didn't happen in World War II, but not what did. I was asking the wrong question. What happened to the German people after the war was over is the most stomach-turning, gut-wrenching nightmare I've ever seen. Everything I've been told is backwards and upside down. 99% 
of American and British POWs were returned alive, the Geneva Convention followed. Eisenhower, on the other hand, invented a new term for a disarmed combatant so he could disregard the Geneva Convention. The footage, even in vintage black and white, is hard to watch, especially the brutalized women. I mostly listened and cleaned with occasional glances. German women of all ages, regardless of party affiliation, were subjected to a living hell with relentless rape as the spoils of war for the Soviets, the British, the Americans. They thought the Americans would be better since they'd had such a good feeling for the Germans. But a decade of Jewish media propaganda had convinced them Germans were monsters to be utterly abused and destroyed. So Americans were often the worst of all. Coming back to the present day, one of my readers linked an article saying that Hamas had gang-raped women on October 7th, and it enjoins the Me Too movement to believe the women. But the only evidence, aside from questionable witnesses, is inferred from the stain on the back of an IDF soldier's pants when she's put in the back of the truck. But as Glenn Greenwald points out, that is certainly from losing her bowels, not from being raped. I replied that rape was against Islam, which isn't to say it doesn't happen, but it wouldn't be a public act like gang rape without being a source of shame. In other words, it's not a Muslim weapon of war. Like the long-ago pronouncements that the 9-11 bombers went to strip clubs and watched porn before going to their deaths, it's pure projection. Even though it was years before I knew the truth of 9-11, I knew immediately that was a lie. But I didn't realize how deep the projection went, and that the Western militaries have conditioned men for a century to use rape as their right and a means of breaking the soul of the enemy, as if it's a reflection on them. As the psychiatrist of hatred know, committing immoral acts creates cognitive dissonance that causes the perpetrator to demean and dehumanize the victim. It bonds men in secrecy within, deception without, the same formula as the kol nidre. It makes people insane. And here I'd like to read from Vanessa Bealey in an interview that I'll have linked in Substack where she's quoting Max Blumenthal on that atrocity propaganda. He writes, Founded by a serial rapist known as the Haredi Jeffrey Epstein, Israeli ultra-Orthodox rescue group Zaka is responsible for some of the most obscene post-October 7th atrocity fabrications, from beheaded babies to mass rape to a fetus cut from its mother. Secretary of State Tony Blinken and President Joseph Biden have echoed demonstrably false Zaka testimonies about Hamas atrocities. Marred by allegations of financial fraud, Zaka is leveraging October 7th publicity to raise unprecedented sums of cash. And then it continues with... Zaka's presence at the heart of a high-level rape investigation, however, is fraught with irony. Until recently, Israeli media coverage of the organization largely focused on gruesome sex crimes committed by its founder, ultra-Orthodox bigwig Yehuda Meshi Zahav. Known among Jerusalem's Orthodox community as the Haredi Jeffrey Epstein, due to his well-documented penchant for raping young people of both sexes, Meshi Zahav's decades-long rampage of sexual abuse was undoubtedly known to Zaka staffers and only came to an end following his suicide. In addition to being a serial rapist, Zaka's longtime leader was a profligate hustler, financing a lavish lifestyle with millions of dollars illegally pocketed from his organization. Brad Pierce, an independent scholar who published an extensive profile of Zaka's corruption in October 2023, 
described the group as the most opaque and suspicious non-governmental organization I have ever investigated. So that, again, seems like projection is the key. I've realized that the history of World War II follows the same formula as the Bible, where the heroes have been turned into villains, the villains into heroes, the aggressors into victims, and the victims into aggressors. This is an important aspect to remember as we go through the undoing. It's not that everyone will disappoint us. We've just put our faith in the wrong people. Once we get over Jesus the weasel, as Josephus, who he represents, certainly was, we can learn the stories of the real Christ, the Messiahs who stood up for the Judean Palestinians and kicked out the Roman Shemite Empire. There are heroes from World War II, but they won't emerge until we renounce the victors as parasites or patsies. Certainly, then as now, the majority of men were moral, but the culture of rape continues. And then as now, those who rape whole cities are the bombers. To reverse everything you thought you knew in 11 and a half minutes, the following video is one segment of Hellstorm on the bombing of Dresden. This horrific event presaged the catastrophe that would come in slow motion to all Germans. And that is called Dresden, a burnt offering, Vertigo, politics, posted by Just a Dude. Mark Elsis also linked a half-hour documentary on Hitler that again changed everything I thought. It puts footage to the words of Leon de Grel, who was a foreign volunteer from Belgium in Hitler's army, who became a close confidant. He shows Hitler as a voracious reader, a quiet military strategist, an economic pioneer, and a thoughtful beloved leader. That's called The Enigma of the Fuhrer by Leon de Grel. At the same time, Nefahotep published an eye-peeling list of military mistakes made by Hitler, which he summarized from the research of Firestarter, whose premise is that Hitler was an agent of Britain or the Rothschild-controlled city of London. Put together, they are too obvious to be mere mistakes and not intentional sabotage. Firestarter begins by detailing 10 mistakes that Hitler made in Moscow and Stalingrad. He writes, By common consensus, the beginning of the defeat of Nazi Germany was the mistake to invade the Soviet Union. Starting in 1942, Adolf Hitler took full control of all important decisions for the army and regularly brushed aside the advice of his military experts. Most days, Hitler stayed up until 4 a.m. or so and slept till noon when he would hold his first military conference of the day. Hitler also regularly told his staff that they weren't allowed to wake him under any circumstance. Firestarter then adds six more that were each a turning point and arbitrarily went against his military advisors. They have to be read to get the full impact of Hitler's interventions to prevent success. When he finally succeeded at losing in 1945, he gave the Nero Decree to destroy all German infrastructure just six weeks before his reported death. This followed exactly the Morgenthau Plan in 1944. He writes, Morgenthau and Eisenhower agreed that Germany needed a good and hard treatment. According to history falsifiers, when U.S. President Roosevelt, British PM Winston Churchill, British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden, U.S. Secretary of State Cordon Hall, and U.S. Secretary for War Henry L. Stimson first heard of the plan in September 1944, they all protested vigorously because it would prevent Germany from feeding itself. Hall argued that 40% of the German population would die. That sounds almost philanthropic. 
Some have estimated that from 1945 until 1950, some 9 million Germans died from starvation. Besides dividing Germany into a east and west part, in July and August 1945, the occupying armies took 25% of Germany's most fertile land and placed it under Russian and Polish control, forcibly expelling about 16 million people, according to British writer Victor Gallant's, with the very maximum of brutality. The Allies forbade emigration, except to Israel, and kept millions of prisoners in forced labor camps. Some Nazi concentration camps remained to be used. Over 4 million Germans were forced to slave labor outside Germany, 3 million in Russia, 750,000 in France, 400,000 in Britain, and 10,000 in Belgium. General Dwight D. Eisenhower labeled them disarmed enemy forces to violate the Geneva Convention. Some 1.4 million died in the Allied concentration camps, of which, according to the Soviets, 450,000 in their camps. The production of oil, tractors, steel, and other products that were essential to food production was stopped. They cut fertilizer production by 82%. They undervalued German exports, depriving Germans of cash needed to import food. During the first six months after the end of the war, Germany's industrial production fell by 75%. Captain Albert Banke compared German and Dutch starvation. In much of Germany, the ration set by the occupying allies was around a thousand calories per day, and for more than two years, never more than 1,500. Nefahotep also has two excellent posts on all wars are bankers' wars, saying there hasn't been a naturally occurring nation-to-nation war in at least two centuries. Each one has been manipulated on both sides by the same bankers. Was Hitler allowed to use a sovereign currency and evict Rothschild? Why then did Judea declare war on him? Was he working for Rothschild or protecting Germany when he executed the transfer agreement and sent a hundred million dollars worth of farm equipment to Palestine with 50,000 Jews? What are your thoughts? Something else occurred to me after I did my episode on the Balfour Declaration. I quote extensively from Benjamin Friedman and his 1961 speech, where he says that the Bolshevik Jews in Germany had fomented for the U.S. to enter World War I and therefore end up turning the tide against Germany, and in exchange what they wanted was Palestine, which they got in the Balfour Declaration. What occurred to me is that Friedman never once says, well, of course, that didn't justify what was later done to the Jews. Today, someone who talks about that would be bending over backwards to make sure that they are clarifying, well, of course, that doesn't justify. But it seems as if Benjamin Friedman wasn't even aware of Holocaust, meaning anything other than nuclear holocaust. That entire line of argument wasn't something that he at all pushed back on because it didn't seem like it existed. And so I have heard that Holocaust went from nuclear holocaust before the 60s. And in the 60s is when this became something that was a a very organized narrative. What I'm wondering is whether that whole narrative developed in reaction to Benjamin Friedman and all the information that was coming out about the Balfour Declaration. Another masterful article that puts together vast realms of information is the Neo-Feudal Review on the complicated relationship between the central bank owners and the Jewish people. He, and I'm making an assumption on gender and I've been wrong lately, 
presents the thesis that the Jewish masses unknowingly further the goal of the central bank owners by providing a passionate co-ethnic solidarity against what they feel is a hostile majority society, in return for the central bank owners offering them small crumbs of money, power, and preference. However, these Jewish masses are promptly cast aside by the central bank owners depending on political necessity without a second thought, and there is an undercurrent of malice by the latter, which suggests the core relationship may strain in the future. Neo-Feudal offers a very sophisticated and comprehensive review of this thesis, often citing Jewish sources. The solution he offers is that Jews should side with white Christian culture rather than the bankers. Yet Neo-Feudal presents arguments by Nietzsche that Christianity was a ruse to get Gentiles and Romans to worship a Jew and honor the Noahite agreement. I haven't read Nietzsche, but I think he comes close to the truth. Where I differ is that I think Jesus represents the Davidic dynasty of the Shemites, the inheritors of the right to rule as God decreed through Noah. They are always aligned with power, including Roman power, and willing to throw the Judeans under the bus. They're the original globalist, not content to rule a country, but intent on being the ruler behind the rulers. Christianity, I think, is the controlled opposition of the Shemitic Roman psyops, and not a rebellion. It's the extension of the narrative, not counter to it. Where the Shemites claimed ownership of the whole antediluvian world, the post-resurrection Jesus claims all authority in heaven and on earth. His instructions are to make disciples, or more accurately, subjects, of all nations, teaching them to obey his commands. Disciple and discipline have the same root and the same meaning of subservience and punishment. The Pope, like politicians, is merely a front man, which is why he kisses the hands of Henry Kissinger, David Rockefeller, and John Rothschild. Christianity serves Israel, and Israel is owned by the Rothschilds, with the Balfour Declaration as land title. The end-time predictions are being engineered, with wars, earthquakes, and famines. But these predictions were written after the siege and slaughter of Jerusalem in 70 CE. To reenact that scenario will not go well for Israel. Israel is another sacrifice zone, like Ukraine, like Germany. None of us can afford our comfortable illusion. We're all just pieces on the chessboard, and no one playing the game cares about us, no matter what our bloodline or religion. On the flip side, however, is the reality that we the pieces care and are much more competent than they want us to know. The Germans were not monsters. The Jews were not the world's victims. We've all been duped into hating each other, but it is not our nature. Rejoice. If you'd like to see where this journey started, here is the first one on C.J. Hopkins and the New Normal Reich, where I ask a seemingly innocuous question. And then this is Forgiving Hitler, which started out as a spiritual exercise and then has delved into this entire wombat burrow, which you can see by checking out Substack. Thank you for watching.